Schaefer at the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research, teaching primarily in literature and philosophy. Uh, so I, I want to start um, by uh, adding my birthday congratulations to Karl Marx, that old specter. Um, and also to thank the Goethe Institute, uh, my, our hosts, um, and my colleagues at the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research, uh, as well as our conversationalists, uh, Juliana, Malik, and Mackenzie, um, and also you, our audience, for sticking with us. So it's both a necessity and a real pleasure to consider Marx at 200 with you, which will mean thinking about how artistic and political imagination have taken up his thought historically, what we're doing with it now, and what use, if any, the future might have for it, how we hold open uh, some kind of sense of aesthetic or political possibility, and how we might need, in fact, to revise Marx in order to do so. Um, so some questions before us are, what do we mean when we invoke Marxist aesthetics or poetics, and what on earth do we want when we do so? So this discussion is going to consider both what's alive and what is dead in Marx, particularly when it comes to the theory and practice of different kinds of art, so visual media, performance, and poetry among them. And one thing that thrills me so profoundly about the people we've gathered to talk through these questions is the range of perspectives that they bring to this topic. Uh, so all participants are scholars of one variety or another, and they also bring something more via their deep engagements with poetry and performance and visual art and popular media. Um, so they'll be introducing themselves a little bit more fully in a moment, so I'll try to restrain my desire to heap more specific praise on their heads for now. <laughs> Panelists have graciously agreed to open the conversation by offering some informal thoughts on particular objects and problems in Marxist aesthetics in order to ground us in the moment. Uh, so we'll start by going around and laying out some initial gambits before moving into more synthetic questions and exchanges. Um, so uh, Ken, is it all right if we, if we start over here with you? All right, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, let me see if I can get my slides to work. Here we go. So from the point of view of the artist as producer, I don't think there's a single Marxist aesthetic. There's no one solution to the formal and substantive problems Marxism poses for artwork. I find the legendary debates about all this interesting but forever inconclusive. And what those debates reveal is more a series of intractable problems. So the aesthetic is about perception, the sensory world. It's about the seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, feeling of the world. It's about sensuous materialism. As such, the aesthetic touches on sensations that are particular. We need not think of them as individual sensations. They can be shared, they can cross multiple bodies. But the sensations out of which the aesthetic is built have qualities, limits, boundaries. They imply a point of view, a standpoint, a situation. So to me, Marxism is first and last the point of view of the working class. We need to have an open mind about who or what that class is or might be or could become. And this is the first problem that Marxism sets for aesthetics, who or what is the working class. Marxist artwork can be for it or by it or about it, but the first problem is basically what is the aesthetic in relation to class. It's a subtle problem once we recognize that the working class is not knowable prior to its coming into an aesthetic form. The being of the working class and its expression are connected. So the first problem is about being situated, about the particular, about material sensation. The second problem Marx poses for artwork is the, pro is the problem maybe not of the totality but of abstraction. The forces within which the working class are constrained or act are not particular and may lack any obvious sensory form. The working class are caught up in, act within and against relations of production and reproduction that are abstract uh, and have no tangible qualities. Now, those are two hard problems. Uh, now, the third problem uh, Marx poses for art work is the problem of the art worker. Who or what is the art worker in relation to both the particulars of her or his activity 
and also in relation to the abstract social technical forces within which the possibilities of that action are shaped. And I think uh, these three problems are constants across what is more than a century uh, of artwork after Marx. The solutions to those problems, on the other hand, are many and varied. None of the solutions ever quite seems to solve all three problems, and so one ends up with many and varied kinds of artwork. And these are sometimes pitted against each other, which often obscures the intractability of the underlying problems. Marxist art workers embark on an impossible praxis. Oh, I'm not quite ready for that yet. Marx himself never solved these problems, and he was, among many other things, a truly accomplished literary artist. He came to the point of view, the labor point of view from without, and wrote towards it through his ironic and sarcastic treatment of bourgeois writing. While focused on the lineaments of abstraction, he's constantly pausing to call forth the worker as a concrete character who suffers and struggles, but one has to admit there's a little bit of ventriloquism in the way he does it. Now, there's no shortage of art workers uh, who took over the role of internal critic and satirist of bourgeois culture, a role that still leaves plenty of room for different aesthetic strategies. It's in Bonwell's cinema, for example, and the tactic is basically to find the particulars of bourgeois culture that reveal its absurdity and hypocrisy as a totality. Like, Bonwell makes like half a dozen movies about dinner parties, basically, yeah? Uh, and also, this is Adorno's whole shtick, to show equivalence, exchange value, undo itself. Now, there's also no shortage of art workers who went the other way and hew close to working class experience, desires, feelings, uh, and most particularly forms. I'm thinking of Woody Guthrie's songs, or the many uh, fine and underappreciated examples of the proletarian novel, uh, and I'll just show one example by Dimfna Cusack because it's set in my hometown, Newcastle, New South Wales, Australia. And of course not canonic, right, because it's about steel and women workers, so it's not literature. With a capital L. Now, neither of these solutions ever really resolve the problem. Uh, work that stays close to working class experience has a hard time touching on the abstraction of social relations. It tends to idealise the class to which it is addressed. Uh, although here, uh, one might mention Elfrida Jelinek's coruscating writings about uh, everyday alienated, uh, everyday life, working class life. Working class culture is as much a product of the culture industry as any other. Yet there's problems with the other approach as well. Internal critiques and satires of bourgeois culture tend to remain of interest only to bourgeois culture. Uh, moreover, the negation of bourgeois culture does not in itself affirm anything much of, you know, beyond that. Uh, these problems are closely related to the third. What is the class location of the art worker anyway? In Marx's day, there were renegades from bourgeois life, not least uh, those who were excluded for other reasons from its world, such as German-speaking Jews. There are also those who defected from petite bourgeois culture, that includes myself, uh, and again, it's not uninteresting to look at how often exclusion, uh, voluntary or enforced uh, on other grounds, uh, from the possibilities of bourgeois culture generated Marxist art workers. There's some examples. Now, once upon a time, the magic solution to the problem of class for an art worker was to be a member, secret member, or fellow traveller of the Communist Party. It's a largely suppressed aesthetic tradition now, only those who publicly renounce the party are usually allowed back into the canon. Uh, and here it's worth pausing uh, to put Adorno's critique of the culture industry in dialogue with the work of those who organised within the industry, uh, both over questions of labour but also over the content of what it produced. Hollywood made no Marxist movies, but it's striking how Marxism became an element within even the most popular art forms uh, particularly in the 1940s. And this gets a not unsympathetic treatment uh, in some more recent movies, whoops, not ready for him, uh, such as uh, Cradle Will Rock, Trumbo, and Hail Caesar, if anybody's seen any of those. Now, the contradictions of the class location of the artist hardly went away in actually existing social estates, call those whatever you like. Uh, here I end up, up being uh, more sympathetic to uh, Alexander Bogdanov's project of prolet cult or proletarian culture than the now canonic uh, Soviet avant-garde. Uh, Prolet cult gave rise to at least one 
uh, art worker of genius, and that was uh, Andre Platonov, who was that rare thing, a Marxist modernist of proletarian origins, who were as, you know, they're unicorns, there are very few of them. Uh, and, uh, but whose major works went unpublished uh, in his lifetime and who's extremely lucky to remain alive under Stalin. Now, in the West, the party was a solution also to the problem not just of connecting the particular of experience to the general of abstraction. It was a way of keeping particular particulars together. The party presented itself as the representation of all workers and of workers as uh, potentially a universal class. Uh, with the decline of the party form, the particulars detach from the abstract, but also from each other. And this has a good and a bad side. Keeping the particulars together with other particulars was an achievement. Uh, but often it meant subordinating uh, others to a kind of ideal type of worker. And moreover, the party's idea of the abstraction of, ca of capital was far from universal. It lacked a lot of dimensions. And in the hands of, say, uh, Amy Césaire or Shulamith Firestone, to give two incredibly different examples. The methods of thinking a situated particular and an abstract social relation together were adapted from Marxism and extended to other forms of, of oppression. So that's sort of the good side. Um, but what we got in its place, so what we got uh, in its place on the plus side were these accounts of the particulars of experience connected to other points of view uh, of what the ruling abstraction was. We kind of pluralized what those really abstra ruling abstractions were, were as well. But we also got a tendency of particular views to fragment and to not talk to each other, let alone to an attempt at counts of abstraction. And to be, to be captured by a kind of a certain liberal pluralist discourse in, in, the, uh, in the process. However, it's not surprising that uh, innovations in uh, cultural form that connect the particular to the abstract outside of the party's understanding of class and capital, were actually often produced by former communists. Uh, let me just mention Claudia Jones, who was one of the founders of the Notting Hill Carnival in London. Harry Hay, uh, who was co-founded the first iteration of Mattachian Society, uh, the, the first organization of gay liberation in the United States, and later of the Radical Fairies, uh, and uh, Doris Lessing, pioneer feminist novelist. Art workers who committed to party work often ended up with a broad experience beyond their class, which ironically enough uh, became useful for making art. Uh, Margot Heinemann uh, was a banker's daughter, uh, but she became uh, the British Party's point person on the coal industry and later wrote a terrific underappreciated novel about working class life in and around the pits of Wales called The Adventurers. And I'd like to compare that to uh, André Breton, uh, who famously joined the party and then refused his assignment to go work with the gas workers cell because he's like, why should I read statistics about gas work? And it's like, dude, you just so, so didn't get this, did you? Like, that's sort of the point. From, that's how I see it anyway. So the, the class location of the art work is a particularly intractable problem. Uh, and one being in the orbit of the party masked for a while. The class location of the art worker, I think, actually went through three stages. First, the déclassé bourgeois intellectual like Marx himself. Second, the era of the culture industry and the industrial organisation of creative production. But thirdly, something like the stage we're in now. So the culture industry still exists, but in the United States, the working conditions that communists and others fought for in those industries are very rapidly eroding. So alongside the culture industries, I think we now have what I call the vulture industries, like the culture industries at least entertain us. The vulture industries oblige us to entertain each other as unpaid labor while they collect the rent, right? So you don't even get the free show anymore. You have to like do all the work. Uh, I think the, oh, there's, there's the three. So I didn't put the numbers of the slides down here, so I'm getting a little lost. Uh, I think the, the Situation International actually foresaw the negation of the culture industry and the production of free cultural information they actually called it literary communism. Um, but what they didn't foresee was the recuperation of that strategy through the commodification of the platforms of the information commons themselves, which was actually just discussed in the last panel. So it turns out Marx's precarious life as a freelance writer now seems like an eerie precedent for how many art workers within the vulture industries uh, endure now. Art work is a kind of work that finds new information in old information, 
Uh, it turns out there's now a whole political economy of information that runs on exploiting this under the guise of creativity and innovation. So contemporary uh, art workers keep Marx alive through all sorts of strategies for enduring the vulture industries. Uh, I just mentioned uh, Roel Peck, who made use of uh, what was left of uh, state-backed cinema funding. All my Marxist friends really like dismissed this movie. Like I kind of loved it and like burst into tears five times. I took my son to see it to show him like this is your father's culture, you know. So it's like I'm I'm just like I mean let's. It, it's not terrible, right? There's things we can say for it. I would just want to, you know, big ups for Raoul for at least attempting it. Uh, uh, let me also mention uh, China Mieville, uh, who survives by writing in a popular genre. He writes uh, uh, fantasy novels. Hiddo Stale, who kind of surfs the information-fueled edges of the art world and writes about the political economy of labour in that world. Um, and those might be sort of, you know, fairly well-known uh, examples. Uh, Perhaps with the decline of the culture industries, what falls with it, though, is the era of the kind of mass celebrity uh, Marxist, and they're mostly dudes, right? Uh, uh, the, you know, the, the Marxist inflected art worker, the, the Sartre or the Pasolini, as, as products of a mass broadcast culture. Now at least there's a kind of uh, Marxist or Marx inflected art worker making work sort of exactly for you, for your particulars. Uh, but who nevertheless connects the particulars to the abstract. And, and here, you know, the, the, the good news is there's like thousands of people. There is someone for you making work uh, along these lines. And so let me just end with a shout out uh, to some personal favourites, Fred Moten and Boyer, Stuart Holm, Geordie Rosenberg, and my fellow co-panellist, Juliana Spar. That's all I got. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I now want to turn it over to, to Juliana Spar, if that's all right with you, um, who will tell you a little bit more about her work um, and also speak to our, our topic. So thank you. Uh, I have this. Oh, wonderful. You don't even need mine. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for being here. It's, been, it's actually been a great day. I've really enjoyed it. Um, that started last night, a great day that started last night. Um, so I feel like I want to confess that I feel a kind of fraudulent showing up here and um, most days I don't really feel like I deserve the insult of Marxists and um, I'm in many ways late to Marx. I went to graduate school um, just as cultural Marxism was becoming sort of state or the convention. Um, and I still kind of have a little bit of resistance to those readings that were being done around the time, like the moments where you would like talk about how language poetry disrupts capitalism because it's got a phrasal economy or an unconventional syntax. Or um, if we would understand, we can see the declining rate of profit in this poem by some modernist writer that was happening. Um, but, and then when I came to Marx, it was through reading Capital with friends and not in higher education. Um, which means not related to aesthetics or poetics, um, uh, though those are my two academic fields of study probably. Um, and then somewhat not in higher education. Um, I sat down and did that year-long study of capital that a lot of people do with two administrative staff members where I work, which is at a college. Um, so we were in higher education, but we were also a bit of an undercommons in that moment. Um, our reading group met during their work hours, which were kind of maybe mine too. Um, and then in the years since then, I kept studying Marx through free school classes on things like Marx and crisis that were happening. Um, so in contradiction, while I feel like I'm maybe not a good Marxist, um, I might deserve the more specific insult of vulgar Marxist. <laughs> I know, you mentioned it last night. Um, and I start with this study um, because it's coming to Marx through community and not through institution, I think is one facet of the Marx now that many people have. Um, have experienced. Um, like where I teach still doesn't teach courses on Marxism, um, which is kind of interesting also because it's a women's undergraduate college and I can't imagine a Marxist course there, it's like, whereas I could imagine it at some other institutions, which is potentially disturbing. Um, I, as a vulgar Marxist, I can say that while Marx has not been that useful for me in understanding poetics or aesthetics, it has been nothing but useful for helping me to understand the peculiar role of literature and capitalism. Why does literature at moments appear to be a resistant form, and at other moments, why does it appear to be so stubbornly of and with the state? 
Um, Marx, when he attempted to understand how the creative arts fit into the MCM prime in early drafts of Capital, left room for something that we might call autonomy. Milton, he claimed, produced paradise lost in the way that a silkworm produces silk as the expression of his own nature. Literary production in Marx's formulation here is at least somewhat extraneous to exchange. Even though, as Benedict Anderson noticed, the book is the first modern style mass produced industrial commodity, even though, as Marx notes, Mater Milton later sold the product for five pounds and to that extent became a dealer and a commodity. Um, Dave Beach and Art and Value, which has actually been really helpful for me to kind of trying to understand this, um, is really insistent on maintaining this distinction in ways that I found helpful. He writes that art's anomalous, incomplete, and paradoxical commodification, and this he continues, means that while art is inescapably brought into capitalism, it is also something independent from capitalism. Understanding this, he adds, is crucial to understanding the basis of art's political engagement with society. To Beach, something like Adorno's claim that art is now no longer also a commodity, but is a commodity through and through, a claim that's prevalent in a lot of cultural Marxism, is a misunderstanding of the role of artistic production in capitalist economies. Art is exceptional to the commodity and capitalism in his understanding. This exceptional half-in, half-out relationship with capitalism is what gives literature the autonomy to provoke, to speak truth to power. The idea that art can be autonomous is behind the utopian formation of the John Reed Clubs by the CPUSA in the 1930s, and is the same idea that provokes Cesare to write that the Martican Revolution will be made in the name of bread, of course, but also in the name of fresh air and poetry, which comes to the same thing. And Cabral to write in Natural Liberation and Culture that the study of the history of national liberation struggles shows that generally these struggles are preceded by an increase in expression of culture consolidated progressively into a successful or unsuccessful attempt to affirm the cultural personality of the dominant people as a means of negating their pressure culture. And for Fanon to write about Chieto Fodiba's African dawn and unnatural cultural, and for Audre Lorde to claim that poetry forms the quality of the light within which we predict our hopes and dreams towards survival and change, first made into language, then into idea, and then into more tangible action. Basically, the idea that literature can be a part of resistance to capitalism, to the nationalism that capitalism constantly instrumentalizes, is an idea that presumes that literature is a saliva that the artist excretes as the silkworm. But this extraneous to the market part of cultural production also makes literature vulnerable to other sorts of conscription in ways that are often overlooked when literature is presumed to be a commodity through and through, or presumed to be entirely a resistance project. Um, Marx does not spend much time on what it means that the silk of literature has an anomalous relationship to capitalism that makes it vulnerable to other forms of conscription. Marx instead drops those sentences about Milton from Capital, they end up in the Grundrisse, and after he talks about Milton and the singer and the schoolmaster, he reminds that the kinds of work which are only enjoyed as services and yet are capable of being exploited directly in the capitalist way even though they cannot be converted into products separable from the workers themselves and therefore existing outside them as independent commodities, only constitute infinitesimal magnitudes in comparison with the mass of products under capitalist production. He's right, but nonetheless, as someone who sometimes excretes literature, even while literary production is not really a great place to understand how capitalism works, understanding how this anomalous role impacts literary production feels somewhat crucial. When I write something that I think of as literature, even when I know I am unlikely to be, ever be able to turn it into a commodity, which is a common state as a poet, um, after I start to feel the saliva gather in my mouth, I do for sure swing my head from side to side in a figure eight, distributing the saliva that will become silk. But the swinging of my head never feels the way I imagine the silkworm feels as she does this. The entire time, I am very aware that after I use my spit to make a mile of silk to cocoon my body so I can be born, Someone will snatch me away and boil me alive before this happens so as to unwind my silk and combine it with the silk of many others to make a fine and beautiful jacket for themselves. The autonomy of my saliva is conscripted in all sorts of ways. Eliot reminds in the social function of poetry that no art is more stubbornly national. I'm not sure that poetry is exceptional in relation to other forms and genres, but the stubborn relation between cultural production and the state exists because the silk part of cultural production is entirely subsumed by capitalism. When state involvement in literary production does not begin in, while state involvement in literary production does not begin in 1945 and intensifies in the post-war period. 
After 1945, a great deal of literature is produced and distributed in and by state-supported institutions. And by state networks, I mean both various governmental agencies and also in the United States, a large extended network of liberal foundations that often work very closely with the government and have revolving staffs with them. Um, the Cold War is cold because of the support, and much of it develops in parallel with the Soviet Union. State support can take multiple economic but not capitalist forms. Sometimes the form is direct grants and prizes for writers. Sometimes the form is the development of cultural centers and other sorts of not-for-profits. Sometimes the form is student loans. But the support, of course, is paralyzed by the repression of the few, is paralleled by the repression of the few writers who are allied with more militant resistance. Um, and it often intensifies in these moments when writers make these alliances with kind of cultural nationalist movements, um, like whether in 1919 or in 1968 to 1970. Um, the support is often seen as a sort of innocent support for the arts. It's hard to critique the idea that you pay, you give an artist some money and that you should complain about it. Um, to notice it is often perceived it as being ungrateful or resentful, depending on whether one has been touched by it or not. To insist that it shapes everything that is literature is potentially to be seen as paranoid. And yet I think it is impossible to understand the contradictory role of literature in this moment without understanding the ways that literature is not a commodity, let it be instrumentalized in various ways within capitalism. If I had two more hours in this talk, I would proceed to argue that this sort of instrumentalization of literature by the state is the reason we are in a moment where a million blog posts go on about literature as utopian and inclusive and diverse, inclusive and, diverse and one that will get Trump out of power, but in reality it more and more resembles something like opera, an art form for an elite, dwindling, and aging audience. The large impact of these forces have had on literary production after mid-century has been dramatic. These forces, more than the market, shape not just who produces literature, but how they produce it, what gets published, who gets published, who buys what gets published, who reads it after they have bought it, who gets it from the library, who feels it tells their stories, who feels it tells stories not about them but useful to them, and who feels it is not worth doing or that it is a thing that other sorts of people do, which is that, you, that when you said the unicorn of the working class writer in some way. Um, in short, literature is caught. That literature is an exceptional commodity lets Lord's claims about the potential within literature to lead us to light have meaning. This is a good thing. And it is the same exceptionality that makes Adorno's claim good, that this is not a time for political works of art. To make it a good time for political works of art, and I'm still going to hold on to that as a goal worth pursuing, one beginning might be to reckon with this caughtness. If nothing else, it begins to explain why some literature is the enemy and some less so. We are in a moment when rhetoric about how literature as, is some sort of resistance is at a fever pitch. And much of it on the internet appears tellingly on the websites of various literary institutions that are funded by private liberal foundations. Um, figuring out which is which is part of the work we all have before us right now. It can be a fun party trick to imagine that literature could possibly, what literature could possibly be after the revolutionary destruction of capitalist social relations, even though chances are our imaginations are as hobbled by the present as anything else. I hope you're at those parties too. Um, there's a small canon of attempts to imagine this that I want to wrap with silk. Among the ones I like best are the Manifesto of the Paris Communes, Federation de Ar de, of Artists, uh, Recluse's Art of the People that also comes out of that Paris Commune moment, the May 17th, 1960 Situationist Manifesto. Um, this is the one where they want to occupy UNESCO. Um, and George Mason Murray's, who was um, a Black Panther for revolutionary culture. Despite the disparate historical moments that influence them, all imagine an art that is other than national. All presume that art could be autonomous from the government and in resistance, all also might be failures. The history that comes after these moments suggests this. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, and now we'll pass it over to Malik Gaines, who again will tell us a bit about his work and, and also how he would like to speak to the brief. Sure, thank you so much for inviting me. Thanks to all of the institutes and these um, panelists I'm here with, thank you. Uh, I thought I could maybe in the conversation section talk a little bit about some of my own performance work and the way 
shall we say, Marxist legacies have played out in a few of those projects. But to start with, I thought I would read a, I have four pages from my newish book called Black Performance on the Outskirts of the Left, in which I track in the 60s and sort of expanded 60s, uh, the way uh, black political language of the time was appearing in performances and circulating transnationally. And part of that circulation, um, importantly, was sort of adaptation, um, uh, reworking, or sometimes refusal of an international uh, leftist project. And by the same token, the ways, for example, the situationists might point to race riots in the states as a way to make a point. There's this sort of um, borrowing that goes in both directions at the time. And to sort of get out of a kind of romantic periodizing, I wrote an afterword about the present um, set at the Venice Biennial in 2015, where uh, a curator who has paid particular attention to African and African American and black diasporic art um, included a lot of that work in the exhibition. And I wanted to think about the way these politics function in representation in that context and in something called the present. So one section is about, um, well, you'll see what it's about. Uh, the question of time as history and as a measure of action was insistently posed by a months long reading of the three books of Karl Marx's Capital in the center of the exhibition a reading the curator Okwe and Wezor describes as a main component of his premise. Importantly, the idea of reading capital aloud placed performance squarely in the center of the biennial and the construction of the square arena stage facing the audience on three sides and many performances filling out discursive spaces around Marxist analysis. British artist Jeremy Deller offered a program of historic labor ballads. American musicians Alicia Hall Moran and Jason Moran responded to black American work songs. My artist father, Charles Gaines, presented a composition that translated political speech into musical notation, and other performances and screenings enlivened the occasion. Marx's text loses fixity in Enweiser's context. The exhibition catalog offers images of first edition title pages of Capital, published in Bengali, Arabic, Serbian, Croatian, Danish, Czech, French, English, Dutch, Italian, Yiddish, Polish, Russian, Persian, Thai, Indonesian, Kazakh, Uyghur, and Telugu. While this suggests the internationalism of that influential writing, attention to the histories of the places where these languages are spoken dis diminishes a sense of uniformity in its reading. In Wazor enlisted the British film and video artist Isaac Julian to direct the live reading. Julian's work has also circulated widely and has offered specific influence on black and queer art practice practices with pieces such as the 1989 film Looking for Langston, an ambivalent meditation on the legacy of Langston Hughes. Working with his partner Mark Nash, Julian's staging of Das Kapital Oratorio heightened dialogic processes. Two readers alternated from either side of the stage. The reader spoke English with cumbersome Italian accents. The reading was accompanied by a projection of Marx's footnotes annotating the speech. The oratorio offered a concrete engagement with politics, while its performed difficulties kept multiplicity alive. The Capital Oratorio followed up on Julian's earlier piece, Capital, a two-channel video presented in London in 2013 and also on view in Venice, in which Julian interviewed the scholar David Harvey in a gallery space, surrounded by an attentive audience. Intermittently, video montages splash across the walls of the gallery, offering bits of economic information, scenes of commerce and trade, and enactments of political crisis. Meanwhile, Julian asks Harvey about capital's conditions. Answering the implicit question of whether or not capital is still relevant, Harvey insists that Marx capably expresses contemporary crises, describing the way capital's motion, acceleration, and precarity are as persistent as ever. Julian mentions Marx's idea that value, as an expression of capital, quote, brings forth living offspring, or at least, at the least, lays golden eggs and suggests a resemblance in that image to contemporary art objects bought for outrageous amounts by billionaire oligarchs, ruling families, and the like. Harvey returns attention to the idea of the fetish and reminds the audience that this produces jobs for no one but a few artists like Julian. 
A couple of lucid questioners wonder if capital is better suited to address large ontologies, such as capital and art, and less adept at analyzing the more detailed places of differentiation within those categories where much meaning can be found. Harvey turns attention to strata of analysis attributed to Marx, the universal, which includes a relationship to nature, the general, where capital's rules dominate, the particular, where variables like wages, rents, and interest rates fluctuate, and the singularity, the place of consumption, where we might recognize our own individual drives and, quote, human passion. Cultural theorist Stuart Hall, who is also in the audience, suggests that Harvey's strata do not go far enough to uncover contemporary conditions and calls for a stronger revisionism. Hall asserts that a revisionist approach might better account for something in Marx's own writing that attends to the productive, the masculine, the factory, while paying less attention to reproduction and consumption, processes which have moved into the foreground of present capitalist life. Though Harvey disagrees, Hall insists that capital does not depict current economic experience, which is ambiguous in that it lacks clear demarcations between classes. With the diminishment of factory production, the privileged proletariat class is no longer so continu contiguous or complete. Julian's video montages that appear within the video include a constructed cinematic scene of suited white-collar workers battling riot police, suggesting that perhaps hedge fund managers might form part of today's revolutionary class. Hall cautions, however, that simply expanding the idea of the proletariat to include different kinds of workers makes everyone proletariats and is not at all a solution. Hall points finally to the fact that capital does not account for gender or race, affirming that further revision to Marx's model is called for. Harvey, characteristically, sticks to his guns, replying that you cannot use race or gender to theorize economic crisis, quote, you can only look at the way capital is racialized and genderized. This back and forth set within a video that itself is an art commodity reveals some of the differences Marx can bring us to. Crucially, Hall's intervention restages the kind of revisions, adaptations, and interpretations black political projects have brought to Marxist analysis, including those of the 60s that I have discussed in depth. While this exchange shows how capital continues to productively shape political discourse, attention to black performance and its relationship to leftist projects shows the necessity of revision when thinking about social differences unarticulated in the figure of the European factory worker. Reflecting this tradition of revision, Hall, an influential figure in the British New Left, called for openness where it comes to Marx. And this is a quote from Hall. This relative openness or relative indeterminacy is necessary to Marxism itself as a theory. What is, quote, scientific about the Marxist theory of politics is that it seeks to understand the limits of political action given by the terrain on which it operates. This terrain is defined, not by forces we can predict with the certainty of natural science, but by the existing balance of social forces, the specific nature of the concrete conjuncture. It is scientific because it understands itself as determinate and because it seeks to develop a practice which is theoretically informed. But it is not scientific in the sense that political outcomes and the consequences of the conduct of political struggles are foreordained in the stars. This reading, identifying a useful science of economics that ought not cross into prognostication, opens two important possibilities. First, an incorporation into Marx's theory of the value of different social configurations than those detailed by Marx himself. Second, a resistance to the notion that Marxism, or all of politics for that matter, have come to fail, as made evident by the present lack of a world workers' government that ought to have been an historical inevitability. Hall's body of writing, which pays attention to race and colonialism, made an important contribution to this first result, helping to retain Marxist analysis as a critical tool for those marginalized more than just industrial class. I said just now, it just says by more than industrial class. By bringing historical material attention to blackness, Julian has argued that Hall ushered in, quote, the end of the innocent essential black subject and the freeing up of positions from which black artists and filmmakers can speak. The second matter, the retention of Marxist analysis in the 21st century and its adaptability, is the proposition of the oratorio at the center of a world art exhibition that necessarily featured several golden eggs. 
Some news reports and online comments suggested there was a contradiction to the reading of capital in the Biennial's Giardini building, while outside enormous yachts lined the waterfront. And further, that the oratorio would have been better eliminated than the yachts. This response said, perversely, yachts are material, Marxism is a fantasy, like the 60s, like performance for that matter. I attended a party on a yacht while in Venice. I judged the yacht to be quite expensive. I was the guest of an artist friend who told me it was a birthday party for a young museum worker. That worker was the daughter of contemporary art collectors whose family fortune, I later discovered, derived from the dealing of weapons. Their big collection includes the work of several artists seen in the biennial, including Isaac Julian's. Class extremities frame contemporary art. If reading capital does nothing to revolutionize this economy, it may at least propose a demystification of its fetishes. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Malik. And we'll just take a moment to reconfigure. Do you mind if I switch places with, oh, sure. with you? Yeah. Thanks, and I, um... I want to turn people's attention to Oh, I already have one. Thank you so much. Oh, marvelous. Do you need one? So I want to offer at this moment more than a kind of coherent position paper, a set of notes and queries on Marxist poetics in the moment. Uh, and I want to start with a gloss, um, one that, that Ken gestured towards earlier, I thought really beautifully, uh, in his work. Um, and the gloss is on this term uh, aesthetics, uh, which comes from the Greek aesthesis, meaning to sense or perceive. And so etymologically speaking, has always been bound up with ideas about materiality and how it comes to us. So modern aesthetic discourse dates by most scholarly reckoning to the early 18th century and its major questions are intimately entwined um, with the very vexed ideals of the Enlightenment. Um, a science of reason, goodness, justice, equality, ethics, and natural law would be incomplete, or so the thinking went, without a complementary science of the senses. So um, to sum up, how to reconcile the precepts that describe cognition, volition, desire, action, and will with those that account for the realm of the sensuous, the realm of the chancy and capacious one of non non-rational experience. So aesthetics develops as a philosophical imperative because 18th century thinkers realized that sensation, perception, and affect were as much human faculties and determinants of human being and behavior as reason. However, um, and this is a big caveat, the only tools that these thinkers offered for understanding the sensuous were in effect the rational methodologies that came out of the same socioeconomic matrix that was elaborating simultaneously the suspect logics of capitalism, classical liberalism, patriarchy, and race. So this is not to say that theories of the aesthetic might not be mobilized outside of and against oppressive structures, but inasmuch as the aesthetic is a kind of ideology, it inscribes in itself and has from its very beginning the contradictions of a set of cultures that could make passionate arguments in favor of ideals of pure reason and human freedom and at the same time fail to constitute as free persons the victims of the transatlantic slave trade, which of course was at its height 
in the 18th century. Um, and here I want to pause for a moment to um, go back to uh, a film that, uh, that Ken mentioned, um, the young Karl Marx, which we did a free screening of earlier this week. Um, and at that screening, uh, Kazembe Balogun of Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung reminded us that it's also the 200th anniversary of Frederick Douglass. Um, and he proposed a really amazing counterfactual scenario and said, you know, what if this film had been, in fact, a meeting between Karl Marx and Frederick Douglass, a meeting that never, in fact, mm -hmm. took place? Um, and I want to hear pause to honor um, that confluence and honor that counterfactual um, and to say I would be first in line to see that film. So um, I want to begin with a, a little bit um, that I have on a, on a handout for you, which is, I guess, one of my gestures at a sort of non-dogmatic uh, Marxist materialism, the, the, the old genre of the handout. Um, so let's begin with the problem of sense. Uh, so in the philosophical and economic manuscripts from 1844, um, one of the primary places that, that people go to kind of figure out what uh, aesthetics might look like in Marx, uh, the German ide ideology is, a, is another one, Marx makes an impassioned assessment of private property as, and, and here I'm quoting, the material perceptible expression of estranged human life. Uh, and I want to dwell on that for a moment. He goes on to argue that the tendency to treat others as property or as disposable instruments for fulfilling various desires, and these can be for labor, uh, wealth, sex, social capital, and the like, comes out of the same logic of capital that encourages us to see the world in terms of what we can possess. And for Marx, this impulse to mastery is a kind of deep wound to the senses, among other things. So he describes modernity's injured, alienated sensorium like this. Um, and here I'm going to quote rather at length, so um, you'll have that text to refer to. Each of humanity's human relations to the world, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, thinking, observing, experiencing, wanting, acting, loving, in short, all the organs of his individual being, like those organs which are directly social in their form, are the appropriation of human reality. Their orientation to the object is the manifestation of the human reality. It is human activity and human suffering, for suffering, humanly considered, is a kind of self-enjoyment of man. Private property has made us so stupid and one-sided that an object is only ours when we have it. When it exists for us as capital, or when it is directly possessed, eaten, drunk, worn, inhabited, etc. In short, when it is used by us. Although private property itself, again, conceives all these direct realizations of possession only as means of life, and the life which they serve as means is the life of private property, labor and conversion into capital, in the place of all physical and mental senses, there has therefore come the sheer estrangement of all these senses, the sense of having. The human being had to be reduced to this absolute poverty, in order that he might yield his inner wealth to the outer world. So Marx's predecessors, Kant and Hegel, um, thought of sight and, and hearing as our theoretical senses, closer to reason and more removed from bodily interest than smell, taste, and touch, and therefore constitutive of the rational, enlightened European subject's capacity for aesthetic experience. For Marx, meanwhile, um, also, again, working from that Eurocentric perspective, uh, the materialist philosophy pushes against many of the idealist architectures in Kant and Hegel. Seeing, hearing, smelling, and tasting exist alongside one another, at least in this particular moment in Marx, rather than in graded tiers. What's more, Marx extends the realm of the senses to encompass the faculties of feeling, thinking, observing, experiencing, wanting, acting, and loving, uh, which is quite interesting. So the dilemma in Marx's view is that a capitalist society conditions us to link all physical and mental senses, without exception, to the interests of what we can possess and consume, so that all sensory experience, whether of mind or body, is reduced to its use value. 
So while Kant and Hegel, again, to differing degrees, argue for the disinterested autonomy of aesthetic experience, to go to a concept that has already proven, I think, of much interest to our conversationalists, its separation from ordinary ways of perceiving and economies of exchange value, Marx's exploration of sense experience as a social interface with the world throws suspicion on the idea that any area of human perception can ever truly be free under pressure of capital. Capitalism. It follows, by extension, that art and aesthetics, poetry and poetics, my brief here today, which are discourses of these adulterated senses, may be really dubious places to invest your hopes of a utopian community of taste. So, I want to move from that kind of exegetical mode uh, into a sort of hypothesis. Uh, a hypothesis about one way in which Marxist aesthetics is alive right now, um, albeit in a way that maybe has nothing to do with Marx's original intent. I want to suggest that one strand of Marxist poetics worth following is the one that understands sensory experience as materially contingent and works to show, inform content or both, the character of that contingency and its implications. This kind of art and literature, if indeed these are categories in which we still want to invest, and as several of our panelists have already noted, um, there may be reasons to hold those categories in deep suspicion. These kinds of art and literature might look like many things, not all of them explicit propositions about political economy, although maybe, maybe some are that. For example, a poetry that prioritizes the relationship between shifting historical materialities and sensory experience, a kind of Marxist thesis, might, as June Jordan's letter to the local police does, offer an extended metaphor in which that tired old poetic rose uh, roses appear everywhere in our, in our English language poetics, becomes a vibrant stand-in for the unruly beauty of black life. Uh, and here I'll direct you to your handout on which the entirety of this poem appears. Uh, in this poem, Letter to the Local Police, Jordan ties the rose to the irreducible excess of the senses as a refusal of instrumentality and objectification. I have encountered a regular profusion of certain unidentified roses, she writes, growing to no discernible purpose and according to no perceptible control. Then again, I thesis in this sense might look like, and here I'll direct you to the second poem on your handout, Anne Boyer's preoccupation with what it's like to inhabit in an ongoing present, all these gerundive ing verbs in a poem called The Place Where in the End We Find Our Happiness, which situates both the promise and the failure of revolution in the small, unhistoric acts of sensory experience. I'll quote in a minute. Um, what I want to say, though, is that what is so suggestive about this poem to me um, is that it doesn't say that sensory experience is necessarily the place where we will find any kind of revolutionary possibility. And it doesn't necessarily foreclose that either. So Boyer writes, how totally under-theorized is breathing? Nobody is in school with their bodies anymore. Meanwhile, um, and here I'll direct you both to the image that um, we are uh, projecting on the screen um, and also to the third poem on your handout, uh, Fred Moten's Gramsci Monument, uh, which is, to my mind, a profound critique of the Swiss artist Thomas Hirschhorn's artwork of the same name, also weighs the relationship between theory and sensuous presence, turning from theoretical propositions like, and here I'm quoting again, if the projects become a project from outside, then the project's been a project forever. To address a you saturated in sensuous language and experience by the end of the poem. And here again, another quote, my cabin and flesh be burning in the hold. I love the way you smell. Your cry enjoys me. Let me taste the way you think. 
Hirschhorn's Gramsci Monument, and some New Yorkers will already know this, was an art installation in tribute to the Italian Marxist philosopher Antonio Gramsci, Marx himself, and a number of civil rights activists and philosophers. In, this monument existed in the shadow of the Forest Houses projects in the Bronx for a short time in the summer of 2013. Moton's ambivalent response to Hirschhorn's Gramsci monument moves through a witty meditation on the word project in order to illuminate the deep ironies and insufficiencies of a poetics of external witness. Uh, the work, however well-intentioned, of a Swiss artist transplanted to the Bronx when set alongside Moton's organic poetics of feeling. And we might think of the title of his 2014 collection of poetry, The Feel Trio, um, the importance of feeling in Moton's work more general, generally, both poetry and theory, or come to think of it, Gramsci's own insistence that the working class needed to produce its own organic intellectuals in order for revolutionary possibility to persist. And yet, for Moton, even a turn to the potential of the sensuous won't save us. Poetry will not save us. They might leave us, though, perhaps, if we're lucky, with a new imaginative project, maybe even a project we can choose, but hardly with the culmination of that project, hardly with its completion. And it's on that mingled hope, uh, sorry, that mingled note of hope and despair, the question of aesthetic imagination and political imagination that I want to end my bit. Yes, our history is also a history of the senses and how they change and are changed. Yes, genres of aesthesis and aesthetic practice alter, dissolve, and are reborn, sometimes even dialectically, as material conditions shift. But this doesn't mean that anything we now call aesthetic or poetic is neatly or completely convertible to politics or practice. So the slightly counterintuitive I, uh, question I want to ask is whether this inefficiency is, in the end, cause for an extremely unnerving kind of optimism, because it means things will be different in ways we can't predict, but also that that difference might involve space for excess, for a kind of necessary luxury, for abundance, the froth above bare life, the hope of all things in the realm of the senses that cannot be reduced to use value. And this question comes to me in tandem with another intimately related to our brief to, for today, um, a line of inquiry that I think has been of import uh, throughout the days of this symposium, um, but which also is one that I was thinking about uh, the other night at the, the showing of Raoul Peck's film. Um, but I repeat it here, uh, newborn. Um, so what is it to interpret to Marx for the aesthetic demands of the moment, and what is it to change him? Thank you. So I want to uh, open up the, the larger conversation um, by weaving together um, a few of the, the shared concerns uh, that the panelists have brought to the fore for us. Um, so as uh, everyone was talking, I was thinking about um, the interest um, today with the kind of vexed position, both of the artwork and the artist as producer. Um, and it seemed to me um, that in, in different ways, Malik, Juliana, and Ken all gestured um, at this um, really, really difficult, long-standing, and I think to borrow again a word from Ken, intractable problem of autonomy, um, sort of the, the semi-autonomy of the artwork, how that feeds into various networks of production and circulation when it comes to who gets to produce art, what that art says, and who that art is for. Um, so I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit um, more about this question of the autonomous uh, when we think about uh, where we are with, with Marxist aesthetics. So I want to take it. He wants, I'm just passing this along. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> 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 we all have one. Oh, you already got one, yeah. It's like I'm trying, 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 trying to think about this one. Yeah. Who wants autonomy? Who wants it? Uh, yeah. As 
as with all of these terms, I feel ambivalence, <laughs> and that's a part of the condition of the autonomous, or uh, what did you say earlier, the uh, extraneousness to exchange, or the kind of exceptional half-in, half-out condition, right? There's a place of ambivalence there. I mean, we keep uh, returning to Moten, who is a colleague of mine. I urge anyone who still wants a costly de degree come to performance studies at NYU. It's a really good department. Um, and on one hand, there's this you know long tradition of black thought that Moten is one of the present people dealing with around uh, the impossibility of autonomy, let alone agency or individual, uh, the subtitle of the uh, new book is Consent Not to Be a Singular Being, right? And this, of course, comes from a place of prohibition where there is no black subject that is allowed to be recognized until perhaps on the side of criminality or in some kind of negative relationship uh, to citizenship or what other, whatever form of individual subjecthood you're trying to construct. Um, and so there's actually maybe, the, what did you say, the froth on the surface of bare life? Is that what you said? Uh, there's a kind of place of... Ex That's a good line. Yeah. While, while there's uh, impossibility in that place, there's also a kind of excess that gets uh, imagined. Um, I'm thinking of working in performance in... I know, in a practice, I'm working in performance in museums, right? I come from a kind of performance art tradition that's a kind of poor production for small audiences um, that then gets sort of swept into these institutions and as a kind of like excess of surplus, right? Um, and it's ambivalent for everybody, right? The board doesn't really want us there, but some impulses in the institution do want us there. Um, uh, for example, in the, uh, in the uh, one time for an exhibition at the Whitney, we did an uh, adaptation of Brecht's play, The Mother. And we, you know, for a kind of you know, fancy art exhibition, we converted a gallery into performance space and made a kind of um, three-person version of Brecht's play, which is an adaptation of a Gorky novel, which is, you know, straight up propaganda. It's not like one of the subtle kind of uh, uh, epic theater pieces. It's, you know, it's really going for it. It's about the, um, the mother of a worker becoming a revolutionary, right? And we would act it out, and we had these sort of dialogic moments in the piece, and found that while the conditions we were describing of how do you hide your printing press when the cops come, like the, the kind of scenarios that we were working through were, were you know, uh, different, <laughs> not exactly describing current conditions, the kind of power relationship still felt exactly the same. And the diagnosis, uh, uh, a, a change has to, <laughs> uh, has to be enacted, uh, felt very much the same. Um, but in the kind of uh, space of a semi-autonomous performance <laughs> collective, um, that is read in so many different ways by so many of the different people who pass through a space like that. And, but nor do we do a Brecht play because we're going to convince the Whitney to lead the revolution, right? There's, there are a lot of sort of different levels of, um, of engagement that are a part of being in that position that's sort of half in and half out of the institution. And so, when it, you know, it's hard for me to arrive at a kind of satisfying answer to a question about ambivalence, because it's ambivalent in itself. Um, but I think a, both in terms of black study and in contemporary uh, production on these, along these lines, there are sort of ways to think about forms of being and forms of action that aren't about a kind of singular subject that can tie back into that. I, yeah, just some quick thoughts. I mean, the utility of art's usually very indirect, and maybe that's a good thing. The autonomy of art was maybe an institutionally useful ideology at a certain time, but, but, and, and the ending of the modern, maybe the ending of that ideology. Uh, the avant-garde's all came true, uh, but in reverse. 
So the autonomy of art really was overcome. Art re-emerged with everyday life, just not how Dada or the Surrealists or the Situationists or the black art movement intended it. Like it, it, ne it never ends the way you intended it. So I, aesthetic strategies are always tactics that are, are designed to work in particular contexts. Uh, so one would, would kind of need different uh, tactics at the time of the collapse of the autonomy of art into a generalized commodification of information. Like I think that's the thing to think. It became part of that uh, and a kind of precursor to it. Uh, so what does it mean to, to think it in that space? Uh, and to kind of actually rethink some of this, uh, the received ideas about art history that, or aesthetic history that actually might not quite match with the present. Like what ones are you thinking? In terms of rethinking? Mm -hmm. Well, I was, I was like giving a shout out to the, what to me is sort of like the uh, lost tradition of socialist realism mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, in, in a certain kind of official uh, literary or art historical space, it sort of doesn't exist. It's like it's unacknowledged, Un unless they change sides. Like those are the ones that are kind of acceptable. Uh, so I, you know, in, in Australian literature, the novel I showed, it's not, it's not even in print. It's not canonic, uh, even though it's the only one about my hometown. It's one of only three about the steel industry ever written there. Uh, so, you know, that actually might be a more useful tradition to look at in some ways, and it, and it might not quite be what uh, its modernist critics said it was. Like, it actually does different things to what, you know, example, Parson Review, you know, said it was doing. It actually doesn't do. So I think there's kind of work there to sort of rethink our sort of received ideas about what those traditions were and what the, what the spaces in them are. So I'm also, uh, um, you know, curious listening to us um, wield these these big um, sort of sledgehammers of, of categories, right? You know, art and aesthetics and all this um, about uh, some maybe smaller questions just about um, media and, and genres. Um, so um, I have to say I, I share Juliana's suspicion of, of kind of casting all of literature as resistance, right? Um, or casting all modes of, of art and what we file under that, uh, under that head as, as potential sites of, of revolution. They're not, I think, and it's hard to, to think of them all together in that way. Um, so I'm also wondering um, if we can think maybe about um, the affordances of a couple of these different types of media. Um, I mean, do we see um, sort of reasons to think about um, hopeful possibilities in uh, different types of things that we file under art making right now, and um, different types of, of poetic moves, or different types of performance moves, or literary moves, or um, moves even into realms of, of intersections among art and, and technology. So um, just curious about does media make a difference? Well, and, and like, I'm from media studies, so I actually think all of art and literary history is just a subset of the study of media, uh, much to the horror of my literary studies colleagues who think the reverse. They think, you know, media is just a subset of literature. It's like, you know, <laughs> you can kind of reverse that whole picture. Uh, so maybe those... Uh, works that seem of enduring interest to me are ones that were actually able to like figure out something you could do with the media of a certain time. Uh, and they sort of become, uh, you know, sort of absorbed into established notions of literature or art later. Uh, I mean, a lot of what uh, Dada was doing had to do with cheap printing and the fact that from Switzerland you could send stuff by mail for free to all of the countries who were fighting the war, because for nationalistic reasons, though, though it was like supporting this free postal thing. Uh, so it's like, oh, well, you just like worked an, worked an angle there and, and got this, this thing to circulate. Later it becomes visual art or literature, and you notice you have to like hack it in half to, to sort of, that's the literature part and that's the art part over there. But at the time it's one thing. And it's like working a, a space of possibility um, that was like incredibly narrow. Uh, so to me, that's sort of the thing. And then how would you not like repeat any of that, but go, all right, so here are these people who, you know, found a tactic for working in a moment, but it's gone. 
and where none of those conditions are the same. And it's like that's the thing to do again. How do you just sort of work the, the potential that you have here uh, to be a publisher or, or to do performance within the, the, the space of possibility that you have? And I, I, you know, because I know both of you are, are working artists um, in, in different ways, um, I'm wondering if maybe um, it can reflect a little bit. Um, I think there was such a, an amazingly powerful moment, particularly um, uh, in Juliana's talk about um, the silkworm and the saliva and the, and the making it into a coat, um, right? And, and how, how does the, the medium that, that you work in, I mean, poetry or performance, um, change uh, some of uh, these questions of production for you? Or how do you think about uh, writing a, a poem or, or mounting a performance uh, when it comes to the question of, of how it is, uh, how it is um, political or how it is engaged with these things? Yeah, I, I, when you were talking about genre, I was just trying to think, yeah. and partially I was thinking about when you are talking about performance as being somewhat outside, like, I mean, clearly it begins as this moment when it's not producing a product, a painting that can be sold, and then it ends up coming into the academy in this kind of like different way. Um, and I don't know enough about what happened right now, if there's like a remains an independent tradition or like one that you would like locate um, as not like kind of located in some sort of institutionalization or not. But I was thinking also about, and then you were talking about the novel and the social realist novel, and then I was thinking about the middle brown novel and the kind of like this kind of international novel that's coming out of the United States in some form because of the various publishing histories. And I was just kind of, I think my only thought was is that all of these genres have these very specific histories within them and they're all kind of different. They tell these different stories, but they're all trying to figure out how to intersect with things. And, they have these moments where they keep trying to have these moments of resistance that kind of like are constantly kind of recuperated into it. Um, and I mean, I don't know what would happen if we were more attentive to not allowing that recuperation or if we could be even, I'm, I just, it's like an open question. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm also just every question I'm thinking through like, a series of different disciplinary spaces, institutional, not institutional. Are we talking about uh, politics? Are we talking about being together? Are we talking about fine art? You know, and so the answers shift for me, maybe because I've been in this maze of dealing with these, yeah. the, the spaces between these disciplinary distinctions for so long. But uh, one, a few things that I find to be wells of, of some kind of resource. Um, particularly working in a kind of genius artist sphere, um, any kind of cooperative work or, and of course collaboration can go either way, right? You can collaborate with a fascist regime, you can collaborate with, you know, right? So I'm, I'm not trying to uh, imagine like collaboration as this pure form, but. It's, it's never been the horizon. <laughs> That's not the right. But at the same time, there's a kind of, uh, you know, there's like an old, you know, uh, Augusto Boal thing, like theater is not the revolution, it's a rehearsal for the revolution, right? And there's a lot of romance in that too. But there's something about actually working together, as someone who works in a, a three-person group, for example, making these performances, there's something about working together to solve problems that immediately are, uh, is a social uh, phenomenon and, you know, inherently political from the first instance and then if those priorities get carried through to the place of production or visibility then um, maybe something about that is communicated. Um, I'm not sure about media. I feel like every student that comes in with a proposal for a thesis or dissertation I'm like but what about what does the internet do to that like you know like everything is about this kind of new incredible mode of distribution that's not about kind of specific disciplinary channels and and sometimes it seems like the you know everything that appears is good everything that's good will appear is <laughs> like a really kind of risky uh, uh, outcome of um, our expanded media uh, terrain so I, I I feel like the jury's out about specific forms m media disciplines but there are ways of working within them and between them that I think still can connect us to the project of being people with people <laughs> yeah. yeah and 
That in itself seems like a way of kind of holding open the, the door to possibility or, or imagination a little bit is, is the, the kind of evolution of, of genres or what we consider art or even the category of art itself um, in tandem with what kinds of collectives we can form uh, to gesture at a point that, that you were making earlier. And it actually reminds me of, of something that I think um, on, what I was noting on, on almost every, every panel we had um, some kind of uh, gesture to, to literature or art. Um, so uh, Nuru for instance, on the on the first panel, um, but also, um, you know, what struck me was was that almost every panel had a reference to science fiction of some kind. To name one of my favorite vulgar genres, um, so we had I think Octavia Butler, uh, Ursula Le Guin, um, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, Ted Chiang. Um, these ideas about. Um, you know, uh, how we imagine different forms of, of being and, and the incredible painful knowledge that things could have been imagined differently. Um, and not that, that that genre among all the rest is particularly predictive, it's not. Um, but it does sort of um, hold open the idea um, that, that we might still do things differently. And I'm wondering um, if that's potentially um, one way of thinking about um, our own kind of um, evolving uh, uh, amorphous uh, genre questions and in other disciplines as, as well. Um, I had that, I was thinking of science fiction also, because I mean, left, the left loves science fiction right now. Yeah. It's the utopian possibility, the yeah. vision of the, you know, like if, it might be the place where we can potentially, we, can, we, we tell the story that it's the place where we can imagine the revolution or versions yeah. of it, right? And yeah. So like there's leftist science fiction writers in particular. And, but the other place that's really interested in science fiction or dystopic science fiction, which a lot of that is, even on the left, is the alt-right, mm -hmm. who kind of has been doing a lot of writing in recent years of these dystopic kind of race wars, finally. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's again like that, the genre always just makes me nervous. Yeah. Around but the, but isn't, isn't, that, isn't that true of every genre? There's a struggle inside it for, you know, who it's for and what it's about. Yeah. And, in science fiction, it went all the way to the award system where, you know, they were kind of like fights about, you know, which novels, and the, and the progressive side won the last couple of rounds. Mm -hmm. uh, N.K. Jemisin just won three awards in a row for three novels, and like, yay, we won. Uh, and the all right people have been marginalized. But, but I think that's the kind of struggle in, in like every genre, except the bourgeois literary novel, mm -hmm. right? It's just always meh. It's like always in the middle. It's just always like some white couple in Connecticut getting divorced. I mean, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just the same old shit for 50 years. Like that's the one that's, that seems uninteresting to me. But uh, whereas I think all of the genres have played a role. Like science fiction was where you went in the Cold War to do stuff you couldn't do. Uh, same with crime fiction. You know, crime fiction allowed you to traverse social layers and you know, it gives you Hamlet, for example, you know. Uh, so, it's like, but it's like, as I was trying to say, it's not one or the other. Like, yeah, you can write in genre, and it's a way to make a living, or write a much more challenging uh, avant-garde literature, you know? Like, I, I don't see it's a choice. Like, they, they each have their affordances and possibilities, and I read all of it. I love it all. I, genre, I mean, genre can do some quick work, though, right? Like, the displacing the kind of feeling of reality from that kind of novel you're describing, even though it is a kind of form with a kind of protagonist and a kind of world and a kind of, you know, g generic rules, right? Uh, when you get past that, then a certain kind of work, a kind of distance opens up a certain kind of attention to the ways of reading, right? Like not just the writing itself, but it sets up all sorts of expectations of how to read. And, you know, genre, uh, in my work, we've used genre very for, forever <laughs> as a way to kind of uh, set up political scenarios that feel too real and displace them somewhere else so that a kind of distance can appear. We have a Western that we're remounting for a, the, the Skirball is doing a Marx birthday festival in the, in the fall and there's like Marx festival, it's in October. Um, I, there's a person, Ethan Philbrick, who's doing like a choral piece set to Marx and I, there's some other pieces and they asked us to do our Brex play and we're like, oh, let's do something else. And the, the Western is set in, it's an older piece from the Bush era. It's a Western set in California. There's like this moment in California history where it's a semi-autonomous republic and it was Spain, then Mexico, then the US hasn't come in yet. And uh, the Western's called non-Western. And 
the problem is that while class is, you know, uh, the, the way that value is extract extracted by those in power is, is the condition, uh, you know, there's no, there's not even any kind of uh, complete sovereignty. There's no one speaks the same language. People are from all over the world. There's a church authority. There's you know indigenous. You know, there's everything in this one space. So the kind of uh, uh, distances between locations of the real <laughs> become like op open places to perform all sorts of different possibilities. Um, and genre does that in uh, a lot of genres. Uh, make that possible. You know, I think people like, especially in a kind of uh, Afrofuturist popular dialogue, people look to Butler and, you know, in Butler every time, <laughs> like, you have to relinquish humanity, probably mate with an alien species that you find repellent, and then <laughs> at that point, maybe there's some hope, right? <laughs> um, uh, I, I, my boyfriend is a super like sci-fi comic like fan guy with a podcast and everything, and he's been uh, noting in his conversations how both in the kind of queer space, following Munoz and others, and in the kind of like Wakanda, like, there's this resurgent interest in utopia, whereas very often in a maybe I don't know how to describe it a more normative or a more white coded or a more heterosexual kind of zone uh, all these fantasies of dyst dystopia keep keep uh, uh, popping up like I'm gonna have to run through the woods with my child with my gun and, we're gonna, like, and you see that on TV and you see that in the the blockbuster movie that just came out where half of the world dies at the end <laughs> um, uh, so genre set us up for that but at the same time uh, I think I think uh, the l larger, more normative view is like we're ready to let humanity go. <laughs> and so I'm still a little bit interested in these utopian models, even ones as, as dark as Butler's, uh, which say we'll have to make some extraordinary change because this is all falling apart, um, but then a future is possible. Mm -hmm. uh, when we, I read, uh, what's the Le Guin one? Uh, the Dispossessed with my grad students last year. And people who don't know Ursula Le Guin's The Dispossessed, it's a, a breakaway sort of Marxist moon and a uber capitalist, sexist, uh, decadent culture on the planet. And they have this kind of conflict. And uh, I was like, so which society seems better? And they had no, they, like, I read it and I'm like, oh yeah, this capitalist society or that's sexist and decadent and horrible is the bad one, right? And they're like, I don't know, you know? <laughs> so, so, so none of this is easy. And I, and I just want to respond to that briefly and then give our other panelists a, a chance to, to respond before turning over to, it over to the audience for, for, for questions, um, which is that one exciting thing um, in, in this conversation that, that just happened um, was the idea that, um, that for me, you know, genre um, is, as I, I think you, you wisely say about these cues that we offer to the reader, but it offers off, you know, the reader resistance, right? So you mentioned um, uh, Jose Esteban Munoz um, and the idea of disidentification, right? Um, the idea that you can read actually sort of against the grain in order to um, to find your way in a, a, a work of, of art. Um, and so leaving that space for the, the genius of the reader. Um, and that also is another way of thinking autonomy, right? Not necessarily as, as independence qua independence, but just um, the texts give you in some way some set of rules that you have to derive for actually interpreting or understanding or, or use them. And I think that that is true of theoretical texts as it, is, as it is of imaginative literature, and I think it's true of, of Marx and how we remake him uh, as well. Um, so uh, on that note, I'll, I'll ask people if they have final comments here and then turn it over to the audience. Yeah, I, I was a card-carrying cultural Marxist for many years. Uh, I, I've returned to my vulgar roots. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was trained in a vulgar Marxism, but, uh, but, the, but the autonomy of uh, everyday working class cultural practice is foundational for uh, Birmingham School uh, as opposed to Frankfurt School cultural Marxism, like that's the foundation of it. And it's, you can sum it up in a phrase which is, the people make meaning, but not with the media of their choosing. So the, there's a, a margin of autonomy in the interpretive practice, uh, 
an, an agency around that, but not with the media of your choosing. You don't have control over that. And, but then the bit people leave off is getting control over that would be the next stage. Uh, so, so what would the socialization of the production of meaning actually look like and mean? Then becomes the question. So I, I wish the, the uh, right's fantasy about cultural Marxism was true and that we were destroying the world. Uh, not actually the case. <laughs> and, and, and I've got to tell you, being one has not helped me in the academy, academy at all. Uh, it does not get you jobs. I don't recommend it. <laughs> I've been blackballed more than once. Um, but we endure. You don't automatically get tenure. <laughs> I, I was so surprised. It's like, oh, it's like, uh, you know. <laughs> Good to know that the universe can still surprise us once in a yeah. while. Um, so, questions from, from the audience. What are your thoughts? Earlier today, uh, a member of the audience mentioned that there is the politics of remembering and forgetting. And so, especially in the context of thinking about the many meanings of the book title alone, Black Performance on the Outskirts of the Left, I started remembering that in an interview uh, with James Baldwin, I recall him having said that he thought that jazz was an even greater art than writing because it's improvisational. And so, especially in, the, in the, the context of how and why black performance ended up and continues to end up on the outskirts of the left, I'm very interested in your thoughts about improvisation. And in this context, I'm also thinking about how um, great black artists like Richard Wright, for example, went into the Communist Party and then said, I have to get out of the Communist Party if I'm gonna, going to continue to make my art in the way that I need to make my art. I'm also thinking about how, even though I'm attracted to certain thinkers in the Frankfurt School, like Habermas, how distressing it is to me that Adorno had an incredibly snobbish attitude towards jazz, and I'm wondering if that's because there was a certain kind of dogmatic tendency among what might be called orthodox Marxists to wrongly conflate improvisation with bourgeois individualism. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that might be a tendency. Uh, I, I mean, that's the culture industry thing, right? I mean, because it's like pop, right? I think jazz and that also is kind of just like the popular form of beyond kind of um, the avant-garde of black uh, improvisation that he's reacting to. But of course, black life is full of improvisation. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, and people move in and out of all sorts of spaces, right? And the whole kind of thing, the thing that I trace has to do with both the state, the rights movements in the states, radical movements in the states, the transnational pan-Africanist movement, the establishment of new states in West Africa and elsewhere, and my cases go from West Africa to Western Europe to North America, and people are moving, you know, people are just on the move. Um, n there is like no clear uniformity around how to put Marxism into your decolonial project, right? <laughs> um, and, you know, do. I tracked Du Bois a lot because he made the same circle and of course he famously wrote against socialism, wrote against communism, wrote against Marxism all through the early 20th century. You know, he's kind of a elitist guy, you know, he's like has a good education and uh, maybe has some kind of aesthetic <laughs> like difficulties, uh, but he's, the reason he gives in a lot of those early articles is because the white working class will never help us. You know, like we, we can't count on them. And of course, by the end, when he's kicked out of the country and retires in Ghana after going to China, and you know, he says, all right, fine, well, we'll, I'll be a communist now. Um, so, you know, it's just not a stable terrain, so it makes sense that people move in and out. I think, interestingly, you're reminding me 
of the first section in Fred Moten's and the break, which is about improvisation. And there's a passage that's often cited where he takes from Capital the uh, question, what if the commodity could speak? And Marx comes up with a kind of poetic <laughs> uh, answer to what the commodity would say if it had a voice. And Moton says, well, of course, at this time, there are plenty of commodities who are capable of using their voice. Um, and that's forgotten in that passage, and he relates it then to a scene in Frederick Douglass's autobiography um, of hearing his Aunt Hester giving this excruciating scream, right? Um, and that maybe, is that, is Aunt Hester's scream a place of bourgeois individuality? I think not, you know. Um, so the other part of that question is I think that expressiveness um, has a different role in black political projects where there is no sort of stable uh, subject from which to perform uh, in the first place. But I got to give a shout out to uh, Eric Hobsbawm, who was, you know, one of the great jazz critics in England, uh, who was, you know, loyal Marxist and communist, in fact, a dead ender till the day he died. And, and as representative of uh, cultural appreciation of jazz in those circles. Uh, and the other, of course, is Angela Davis, who in the 90s wrote a really terrific book uh, on uh, women blues performers. I mean, precisely to kind of recover, uh, you know, what is uh, working class black women's subjectivity about uh, and finding a, a place you could find it recorded that's outside of writing because uh, it's in the lyrics, you know, and we have recordings of the lyrics and so, of the songs and so forth. So, so the, the relationship between um, sort of transnational party culture and jazz is actually complicated and nuanced and sometimes supportive and sometimes not, and had a tendency to like traditional jazz more than modern is another thing, and, and the judgment's usually been against them on that. But there's actually something to be said for the valuing of uh, traditional forms as well, perhaps maybe to a fault. Uh, in, in party culture. But also a lot of our received ideas about what party culture was like, I just think are uh, like liberal propaganda uh, and not the one to believe the party's view of itself at all, but like the, it's, a, it's an, speaking of memory, it's something that has to be kind of recalled and sorted through to, to get, you know, what actually happened between those two versions, both of which are obviously interested. Uh, that perception of jazz, too, has this Cold War history again, right? The Soviet Union was social realist, and, you know, these other experimental forms were bourgeois individualist, and that got, the U.S. played into that, too, and it used jazz, ex you know, extensively in its kind of cultural diplomacy and soft diplomacy propaganda networks um, at the time in response to the Soviet Union. And so we kind of, those histories kind of take, go down and we kind of, we'd have to untangle those too to begin to understand like the position of those in some way. Um, uh, I actually had big hope for this panel as an artist but you did not seem to address <laughs> all my questions, and I have many of them, but could not even start. Let's start with um, when I was a little girl in the Soviet Union, I was surrounded by images of Marx, Engels, and Stalin, oh, not, not Stalin, and Lenin. Stalin disappeared before I was even born. Uh, but they were in the row, Engels, Marx, and Lenin. And, um, <clears throat> but when we hear and actually everywhere talk about images of revolution and face of revolution, it's usually uh, Che Guevara. So why not Marx? What do you think as artists? <laughs> I mean, there's a, 
uh, a moment in the 60s where uh, the Soviet model doesn't seem attractive to anybody, so people like pick another party. Uh, so there's a kind of valorizing of uh, Mao Che and Ho is the third one. Let's not forget Ho Chi Minh. Uh, as you know, you, you kind of like, uh, oh, like call it what you like, state capitalism, state socialism, it didn't really work out in the Soviet Union, it looks terrible. Uh, maybe it can be reborn in, as exactly the same thing in some other place. So there's a kind of desire for the thing to actually exist uh, and for it to have a kind of charismatic figure. And because uh, the Cubans chose not to have that be Fidel and they built up uh, the cult of Che. Uh, and there's one famous photograph, you'll notice, that, that circulated ad infinitum of him. But there were other models. And as uh, Drusilla was saying um, last night, uh, in the Global South, there were other models besides those as well. Uh, uh, like those are just the ones that seem to circulate in the West as a way of sort of reviving that hope that something could actually already be existing. But, uh, for those of us who never really thought this was much of a fantasy, it's more of an historical artifact now. Could I ask one for more questions? <laughs> um, I also wondering about the um, phenomenon of um, <clears throat> Superman in American culture. <laughs> And uh, for me, it's very alien. I was raised differently. And again, I, we, we all were equal, and women were equal, and everybody were equal. It was not worked in society like this, but still. Um, and um, <clears throat> could you connect it to some um, Marxist ideas and what, how it's, um, no, what, how you comment on this? So may we actually collect a, a few? There were a, a few hands back there. Not being American, I have no idea. It's a mystery to me. <laughs> mystery to me too. <laughs> Isn't there like a game show where you can call like a lifeline? Right. If I could call my boyfriend, he can explain it right now really well. But I think there's something to the fact that he's from Krypton. He's from another planet and he comes to save the world. But because these, um, because these corporations now uh, produce multiple messages that are equally consumable, there is a Soviet Superman who didn't land in the Midwest. He landed in the uh, Soviet Union. And in that comic book, he's like, there's pictures of him up on the wall with Lenin and everybody else. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, my question is about so in the like after, in the post-war period in Europe, um, the difficulty of finding of discovering and understanding what this proletariat might be under new conditions and relations of production um, led to what I would see as like kind of an attempt to constitute the proletariat in a literary sense. So this idea of searching for the working class artists, but also searching for working class themes. And the difficulty of this and the politics of this um, and the fact that the Stalinist parties for the most part focused on quite a narrow subsection of what um, the working population was in order to constitute them as the proletariat led to some um, inverse reactions. And what I'm thinking of here is um, the group that Badiou was working with in the 1960s, the UCFML, who's like classic central mantra was that there is no proletariat and that was how they got around the problem of like the fact that they were working really with with immigrants with like uh, North African um, emigres and trying who weren't part of the industrial working class but who were still workers and that kind of thing I don't I'm sorry if that's taken us tangentially away from literature but the interest that I have there is like yeah the difficulty of constituting this proletariat and finding the working class artist and finding the working class in general could lead to this abandonment of the proletariat as like a, a political category. I don't know. What do you guys think of that? Are you still taking more questions? I think we're going to collect a few. Right, going in a slightly different direction from, from that. Um, um, how to frame this. So there was a lot of criticism of uh, figures like Richard Wright, Ralph Ellison, um, 
and others um, from the 20s, roughly through the 50s, of black artists and intellectuals going into the Communist Party being an actual betrayal of the black liberation movement. Um, and it being uh, a site of removing some of the best and brightest from the actual organic struggles of the community into kind of uh, privileged spaces of whiteness. And that, you know, uh, some of the arguments best articulated, not directly about them, but by, but by Malcolm, um, a kind of against this, this trend to a certain extent is that, you know, these folks are making you and propping you up. Uh, and giving you an audience and giving you legitimacy within the kind of the white world uh, to articulate views and points of reference um, that kind of codify their notions of resistance uh, and perpetuate certain narrow notions of what African people or what black people could do or, or should do. Uh, and so I want to just bring that into the, the space because it was not always, at least in the 50s and 60s, it was not always articulated as counter Marxism, but counter an engagement of a certain type of politics found most, most explicitly within the Communist Party itself, right? Uh, and that some of those artists and intellectuals were, were accused at base as being opportunists for going into those spaces as opposed to utilizing spaces within the black community or creating their own spaces, which I think is part of the rupture that happened within the 1960s, you know, uh, uh, from, the, from the generation in the 1940s, if you consider, as I do, that generation in the 1950s somewhat lost because of McCarthyism and disconnected from a direct, somewhat disconnected from a direct link. So I just wanna bring that in to kind of challenge some of um, where and how these ideas actually enter into our movements and in our spaces, and that there are different, there, there historically have been different transmissions belts other than these parties themselves. And can, can I just mention something quickly? I think it maybe relates to your comment as well about how do we redefine the, the proletariat or abandon that as the organiz, organizing structure, right? Uh, I mean, in that section, there's this conversation about is race its own structure or is race a category of class, right? And there, there's this article in the New York Times a couple weeks ago about how African-American men who are born wealthy in the United States are more likely to die poor, right? So how can you, how can you not see in, 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 our, in the United States, but also in various like colonial situations, right? Like it's so much more complicated than class organizes all structures of difference. There are these various competing, colluding, contradictory, axes of power that have to be thought about wholly. Um, and so that's, in, that's part of the kind of intra-movement uh, 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 debates that you're describing. Should we go work with the communists or should we do our own thing? Uh, but it's also a problem of using class as an, a lens to understand something like uh, uh, police violence, right? Yes, there is a strong economic component to that. Um, a wealthy person may also be shot, right? Um, and it just means we have to think about a lot of things at once. Thank you. Um, I, I was thinking of the, you know, con some of the conversations from yesterday when we were talking about more economistic terms, you know, surplus value and labor power and things like that. And I, I was struck by, you know, you started the um, uh, uh, talk by uh, hearkening back to the etymology of the word aesthetics and that was quite important to the structure, structure of the talk. So when we think of these economic categories, we don't feel compelled to think of where did the word surplus come from and, and where did the word labor come from, the etymology of these words. And this kind of makes me think that when we think about aesthetic categories, 
they are much more situated, they are much, much more specific to the cultural, you know, there's a kind of more situated and more particular. And I wonder what that does to the prospect of banking upon aesthetics for a kind of building a kind of um, resource for struggle that ultimately will have to be global. I mean, yesterday we were talking about things like learning from experiments happening in different parts of the world. And if we transfer that to the aesthetic domain, I mean, if we look at things like um, what kind of resources are people using, you know, something like genre, something like what is a poem, what does it mean to read a poem, what does it, what kind of um, act is it to read a poem, what is a library like this, these things are going to be very culturally specific and the more distant from Western culture they're going to be, the more different they will be. So if you have any, th any thoughts about how would we weave these kinds of aesthetically based projects that are Marxist into a common kind of struggle. And there's one last comment I was thinking of, you know, Trotsky after the Russian Revolution said that we will take the workers to go to see the opera, to go to see the theater, the great works of European bourgeois production because they're complex, they're important, they're, they're good for workers to look at. And he wasn't talking about things specific to Russia. He was thinking about, you know, sort of a common Western cultural heritage that was going to be universal. So I'm, I'm also wondering what to make of, make of that in this, in this context. So um, I, I think um, all of those are, are really um, provocative and exciting comments on how we might think uh, the aesthetic and whether there is, in fact, a kind of relic of a, of a universalizing project that we can make good on in our own struggles for resistance. Certainly, I think there's so much to be learned um, from decentering the, the Eurocentric perspective of, of what aesthetics is as a, as a discourse. Um, certainly that, that term wouldn't even apply in a lot of contexts. Um, there's a lot to be learned from doing that. Um, I think also that, um, you know, I, I, I might have had a line to this effect earlier, but that we do not yet have and we have never had the kind of perfect conversion or, or even weaving in of, of aesthetic experience into a kind of politics or into a kind of project of resistance. And it's been tried a lot of different times. So, um, you know, I'll go back to um, uh, Soviet realism, and I'm kind of with, with Ken here, and that there's, that's actually a much more interesting tradition than I think people give it credit for being, um, and there is much in, in that program in itself to, to be learned from. Um, but I think, too, um, that um, one thing that we might want to give up um, is the, the seeking of, of perfect conversion. And that might be the, the first step um, in actually diversifying uh, the, the grounds for a really material, gro materially grounded uh, education in the senses, um, which I think is, is part of what an aesthetic project can, can offer, more broadly conceived. Um, but yeah, the, the degree to which that actually translates into a specific program of resistance, I think, is still dark to us in many respects, so I hesitate to be prescriptive about it. I mean, the, there's a, a version of telling the story of uh, leaving the orbit of the party to do another project that's made against it, and I was just actually just creating the sort of dialectical complement to that. Uh, what I found interesting is, is the way that uh, central figures dealing with women's liberation, black liberation or gay liberation, uh, took habits of thought from a Marxist training and created a different relationship between the particular and the abstract. That's from that training, even though it's made against that training in some regards. So, so I think it's time to sort of like, like move on from the, the against part of the story to a for and against part of the story as, as to how those innovations and how you think the, the thought of liberation and struggle in relation to a once central and now extinct version of it, right? Like we, can we stop like, you know, beating up on the party now that it's just gone and kind of like uh, coming back to memory to like pick the pieces out of it that are actually might still be worth recalling. Because uh, sometimes it was able to be innovative as to who the proletariat was. Uh, the Aboriginal cattlemen strike in Australia in 1948 was party led. And the, the first problem was how do you all go out on strike on the same day with people who don't use the calendar? Uh, and the innovation was books of raffle tickets. So tear a ticket off every day when you're out, then we're all out. 
So it's like a way of coordinating action in time with people who didn't think about time in terms of calendar time, but well, that's what makes a strike effective. So in terms of culture and art, it also strikes me as having an interesting dimension. So yeah, like the, I, I'm just sort of like pushing back on the, the Cold War version of the story because it's over. Uh, to try to find another way that one can think about there being a memory of cultural resources here from which we could get other things that we don't even know are there because we were made to forget about them. Hi. You've uh, prescribed socialist realism as a, something to cultivate. On the other hand, there's a sometimes there's a proscription about things that are not socialist realism. I'm, I'm surprised that uh, Kafka was forbidden in the German Democratic Republic. And uh, you can cite other writers as well. So how do, how do we uh, not proscribe? We prescribe, but we don't proscribe. No, you mishear me, I'm not prescribing no. anything. I know that, but, but mishearing but, yeah. me completely there. I know, but but uh, when people have power, they start saying, "Well, you can't do this, you can't do that." That's what I'm saying. When they, when people actually get to the power, when they're not there, then it's fine. You can do whatever you want to. Yeah, well, I, I think we're all agreed not to do that, right? <laughs> uh, but the 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 uh, Australian novel I mentioned, uh, it's written in 1953. Interestingly, supported with a Commonwealth literary grant, so the. The state was actually supporting some communist writers in Australia because we owned a bit of the state. The state's a little more complicated sometimes than in the American situation. Uh, so you write a novel about industrial town, 1953, but you set it during World War II. Why would you do that? Because the men had all left, right? They were all overseas, so it's a novel about women. It's actually a feminist novel, but within the space of the conventions of socialist realism. So like sometimes you find things there and it's like, ah, oh, that's actually kind of interesting. And it's doing work that it's sort of actually even not even supposed to do. Uh, and there's probably a, a filter on its publishing that it had to negotiate. Uh, there's some lovely satirical pages in Doris Lessing about, you know, party editorial judgment and how narrow it was, and she's right about that. Uh, but some of the things you find there that are kind of forgotten, you kind of go, oh, there was a people's literature in the West, uh, but we kind of forgot that it existed. Um, I want to go back to the um, betrayal of the Black Liberation Movement because it's something I've been interested in. Can, can I do a reverse question? Like, is does like Cooperation Jackson have like a cultural component or interest in cultural production at all? Is that an important part of it? Absolutely. Uh huh. Can you talk more about it? More in what sense? <laughs> Just like details. Like, what what form does it take? Like, you know. Um, what would it mean to have a form of support for cultural production that isn't based in kind of a state arts grant or an institution in terms of the MFA? Um, so, I mean, what, what's in place now is a, uh, I wouldn't call it a co-op at this point, um, but there is a, a collective of, of artists, myself somewhat included amongst them, called Revolutionary Resonance. Um, you know, which is um, just trying to be more attentive of, a, of infusing culture into everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's an intense debate about what the hell that actually means, right? Um, is culture cooking? Yes or no? You know, is culture childcare? Yes or no? Um, you know, my answer is yes to both. Um, uh, but then, like, how does that play into the programmatic work of the co-ops that actually exist and those that are coming in, in, into formation? Um, and then there's a big debate around, you know, um, how do we support um, uh, revolutionary resonance becoming a co-op in such a way that the 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 cultural workers can actually make a living doing it, right? Uh, doing what they love, doing that activity. And there is no easy answer, <clears throat> particularly within our context, particularly within the confines of the market, and particularly trying to do things that are not necessarily um, commodified as the first response to, to putting things out. 
But I can tell you, so that's, there's, there's an active debate in what, what we're doing now. So just yesterday, we had a, our own 200th anniversary slash Cinco de Mayo uh, event where there was, um, there was a spades tournament. There was uh, a hoop house for kids. Uh, there were three DJs. And this is all going on at the same time. Um, and, you know, when, when and where the weather permits, you know, throughout the course of the summer, spring, I mean, the spring, summer, and fall, this is, is the kind of a regular activity that we try to do like every Saturday. Mm -hmm. And before, uh, that's like in the afternoon, and then, and then the work, we have what we call Kazimab, which is like a volunteer, where we try to get all the members and people in the community to come and do some volunteer labor in exchange for like time banking. And then there's like a cookout, which is part of what we think is a culture which is basically free food for anybody in the community, whether they work or not. And then there's kind of like this cultural exchange over eating food. So that's all part of we see as kind of the development of culture. But uh, our aspiration is to develop uh, our own media center, first and foremost. Um, and that goes back in, in part to what we, what we were talking about um, somewhat yesterday about or I think it was this morning, I'm getting it all mixed up. It may have been this morning, uh, which is about how do we actually share art, vision, politics in a way that is attractive to other folks in the community uh, and to use that to try to point towards a new future in a new direction. And art being, in our view, I think in a broad sense, very essential to doing that in a way in which me articulating a speech or a political program cannot and will not necessarily capture the hearts and minds of, of folks in the community. It's kind of, I think, our general view, right? So it's very central uh, to us and some, I think it was you. The, the main, our main inspiration for this politically is Amlakar Cabral, you know, uh, uh, and that, I think the out of the tradition I come with the, the come out of that particular articulation of his particular articulation of culture, I think has been at the foundation of a lot of our organizing work, even though it's not explicitly stated in that way, it's it's much more or at least the attempt and the aim is to always be integrated. So uh, I want to ask our, our panelists if they have any final comments or things they want to put on the table here at the end and, and just gently bring us to a close. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think in this question of forms, genres, social realism or not, it's instructive to look at those cases historically and see to what extent they've supported movements and or states. <laughs> I think the lesson of New York today is any form, genre, or style maybe can be deployed to support the status quo in one way or another. Um, and, you know, I think, like, I've always been interested in American realist painting that continued after abstraction had already ascended and taken over. There's a kind of, like, counterculture there. Sometimes it's conservative, sometimes it's actually leftist, but there's an interesting culture there. But I was thinking about that when and we were looking at China's model dramas in my undergrad class this week, uh, a different kind of... Uh, uh, you know, like uh, adaptations of Beijing operas that then are about revolutionary party politics, right? That's not exactly realism, it's something else. Um, but any of, any of these forms can be probably, I'm, 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 I'm sure there are, might be one exception, <laughs> but many of these forms can be deployed to any sort of political end with enough power behind them and enough intention behind them. And, and they are mutable, right? Um, so part of, I think, getting right with both their mutability and the fact that they can be deployed to different ends is also coming to terms with the idea is that um, the social forms that we need, and, and art is no exception, um, might look very different in the future. They might look nothing like, like the, the genres and the moves and the modes and the forms that we have available to us in the moment right now. And, and getting very right with that, I think, is, is part of a socialist project. I don't 
know that I have anything to add. <laughs> I mean, it's been, I've been really interested in the discussion because I'm always trying to figure out um, where, um, if we can make it, if it's possible to begin to understand like what makes an art that's aligned with like a left tradition and what doesn't. And I'm, I'm, I have not yet found the answer. Like, I mean, I don't think it's as simple as the funding apparatus. Yeah. Um, although I think that's part of it too. It can't um, be ignored, certainly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just think it's, it's the three things. Uh, a particular situation that one has an aesthetic relation to, uh, abstract forces of oppression that one attempts to uh, connect to through the particulars, and then some relation as an art worker to some notion of a people. Like, to me, those are the only three specifications. Uh, and that has created such a wide and interesting variety of possible aesthetics that you could spend a lifetime just tracking them down, remembering them, passing them on and recreating them uh, as because the struggle goes on, right? And, uh, and among the proliferation of forms are, are ways to say goodbye. So I think maybe... <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. ...to bring the panel to a close on that note. Thank you so much. Thank you.